It's so good to be with you all. I'm Pastor Danielle Denise. Welcome to week one of Bishop Smith's Bible study. Hi, North Carolina Synod Lenten Bible Study 2024 participants. This is Bishop Tim Smith here. Um, I need to come clean and let you know that while we're really glad that you're here on this first night of our Lenten Bible study, uh, which is February, let's see, February 21st, I'm having to figure that ahead. My uh, thing that I need to let you know is I'm recording this in November of 2023 because I'm getting ready to be on sabbatical most of December, January, and February of 2024 uh, then, and that's when Bible study starts. So the first two of these Bible studies I'm recording in advance, and then I will be with you live for the three sessions that will be during the month of March. As always, these will be available online, and a lot of people who can't be present live, uh, or just because they prefer, I can come back and watch the recording. But we are so very glad that you're here. And this year we are going to be, for a number of reasons, looking at the biblical book of Micah, the prophet Micah. Uh, if you're trying to find out where it is in your Bible, uh, I learned a little rap song about uh, Zeke and Dan, Hosea and Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah and Micah. <laughs> so it's uh, it's right there in that group of what we sometimes call the minor prophets. Um, I'm really uh, excited to share this book on a few levels. It's only seven chapters. Uh, and three years ago, we did the book of Isaiah, a major prophet, huge, 66 chapters. And we tried to do that in five weeks. And so we really just were able to touch on the highlights. We'll be able to get down in the weeds a little bit more around some of the very same issues with the prophet Micah, because Micah was a contemporary of Isaiah of Jerusalem in the 8th century uh, before the Common Era, BCE. And so uh, we're very glad to be able to uh, study a little more in depth. And so tonight's session, this first one, will be uh, an in-depth look at uh, background information, which is really critical, the whole world scene, the whole ancient Near Eastern scene, um, the political reality, the economic realities for which and for whom these prophets speak. All the more important uh, because this prophetic uh, tradition is the tradition with which Jesus associates himself. And so in some ways is a continuation as well as fulfillment of that prophetic tradition. Uh, and so uh, we move on from there. Now, I know that there's a host from the North Carolina Synod staff for this session uh, and may have already prayed, but I'm going to pray with you as well. Let's pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for every good gift. We pray an awareness of your presence, your protection, uh, your surrounding us, and your Holy Spirit to come to us through this word, to comfort us in our affliction, as the prophets do, but also to afflict us in our comfort, as the prophets do. Open our hearts, open our minds, change our lives through this word in Christ's name. Amen. Sharing the screen, um, I wanted you to see the world picture. And when we say the world, this is the world that the Jewish people would have known, uh, the ancient Near Eastern world, which includes the Mediterranean Sea, the Caspian Sea, the Black Sea, the Persian Gulf, you see sort of on the, the edges, even the Red Sea uh, to the south, uh, west there by Egypt. Um, but uh, the, the ancient powers uh, and this this would have been a map, uh, certainly somewhere around the time of Micah, where you would see those uh, powers. But what I want you to note, and we uh, noted this uh, about the historic and even today, the geographic and political importance of what we call Israel, as well as the religious significance, it's, uh, cannot be overlooked. Um, the ancient powers had always been Egypt, and they would rise and fall and rise and fall, but Egypt and then all of Africa. Uh, and so Egypt is always huge, and they are a very wealthy nation. They often have food when other nations don't. Um, and then you see uh, Judah, the southern kingdom, uh, uh, there in the, the southeast, and above that, Israel, 
the kingdoms had split, remember. We'll talk about that some more. Syria to the north, which encompassed Damascus. Uh, then you have uh, uh, Beth Eden. You have uh, to the north, you have Ararat. You have Assyria, Babylonia. And then later on, you have the Persians. But for this period of time, we're not talking about the Persians. But the kingdoms that are really uh, relevant in Micah's study are the kingdoms of Israel, the northern kingdom, co consisting of 12 tribes, Judah, a separate nation, separate king, to the south, which encompassed Jerusalem and two of the tribes, and Assyria was the force to be reckoned with at the time of both Isaiah uh, and Micah. And so, uh, you see this little narrow place. There's the Arabian Desert there. You can't just walk across the Arabian Desert very easily. In fact, up until the time of King David in 1000 BCE, a camel had not even been domesticated, so people did not ride those. So going across the desert was really not an option. And so essentially, you had to follow these nations that you see there and follow the water. Uh, uh, the rivers, if you're going to go anywhere, which meant to get from Egypt to any of those other countries up north, you had to go through Judah and Israel. And to get from any of those up north countries down to Egypt, you had to go through Judah and Israel. That small, narrow, and yet critical geography, critical water, uh, critical reality before we get to the religious significance. So uh, just wanted you to, to have that in your mind about where we are talking about. Um, this is uh, a picture just to give you, because Micah is going to be the last quarter of the 8th century uh, BCE, 722, 721-ish, uh, the kingdom of uh, King David, which was the largest Israel had ever become, um, was roughly around 1000 BCE. And you will see that that kingdom encompassed all of what we would now call Syria, uh, what we would call uh, Damascus there in Syria, and then way on up uh, into uh, some of those other uh, lands and it did not last long. David had a son, right? Solomon, the one who asked for all the wisdom. Solomon did what David did not do, and that is build a temple in Jerusalem. And that was one of several factors contributing to the great and rapid diminishment of the whole nation of Israel. And by the time Solomon dies, and his son Rehoboam takes over as king, the kingdom split. Much smaller, the northern kingdom, called mostly Israel, with the capital of Samaria, and the southern kingdom, uh, called Judah, with the capital in Jerusalem. And one of the biggest things that separated them was how and where a faithful person of God, of Yahweh, would worship. Now, this is going to be part of Micah. It was part of Isaiah, part of all the prophets. The Israelites, who were also called the Ephraimites or the Samaritans, worshipped on top of mountains, much like Moses did. They had their various shrines. To the south, in the kingdom of Judah, Jerusalem was the center of worship because the temple was there. And the word in the south was, you have to come to Jerusalem. You have to make offerings. You have to pay the priests. You have to take a pilgrimage. Um, all of those things. I mean, we, we know the story of, uh, you know, Jesus's family who lived in what would have been the northern kingdom uh, uh, in Nazareth. Uh, but they had gone when Jesus was 12 years old on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, as one would do as a good Jew. And there was always this tension between the north and the south. Prior to the prophet Micah, again, around 1000, King David captures Jerusalem. It becomes the capital of his united kingdom of Israel, which did not last long. In 962, uh, 
Biblical King Solomon builds that first temple, uh, 931-ish, Solomon dies, and the United Israel ends. Again, didn't last long. Uh, Jerusalem becomes the capital of the kingdom of Judah, uh, and then uh, right after that, Egypt uh, invades Jerusalem, sacks Jerusalem, and so on and so forth. And then you see around 853, the Battle of Karkar, Jerusalem's forces fight against Shalmaneser the third of Neo Assyria, uh, and you get all of these uh, things that you can read about in First and Second Kings. Eight fifty, Jerusalem sacked again by the Philistines, Arabs, and Ethiopians in a coalition uh, who looted King Jehoram's house and carried off his family, except for his youngest son Jehoaz. Eight thirty. Hazael of Aram, Damascus, conquers most of Canaan, Palestine, the northern kingdom. Uh, and Jehoash of Judah kept him from destroying Jerusalem by giving almost every treasure in Jerusalem to him as a tribute. I'll give you everything if you just don't destroy us. But he destroyed all the princes of the people in the city anyway. And then 786 BCE, Jehoash of Israel sacks the city. Now, you heard that right. Please understand, and this is really important, at least at the time of I'm recording this, when people say, shouldn't we support the biblical Israel? Well, what time period of the biblical Israel? Because right now, Israel, the northern kingdom, is attacking Jerusalem, um, which is the southern kingdom, and they fight against each other. And um, the northern kingdom enters into coalitions with the Syrians and the Assyrians against the southern kingdom, and the southern kingdom enters into coalitions against the northern kingdom. They fight each other. That's what's going on leading up to Micah and Isaiah, uh, those four prophet contemporaries, which would also include Amos and Hosea of the last quarter of the 8th century. Now, in 740 BCE, the Assyrian military victories of Tiglath-Pileser III over Uzziah of Judah, but not Jerusalem. Oh, they tried to sack Jerusalem, uh, but they did not uh, do it. You can read about that in Isaiah. That just sets the stage in a helpful way. So, Again, from approximately 922 when the kingdom split to 721 BCE, the divided kingdom of Israel, which began at Solomon's death, and while there are two southern tribes, Judah and Benjamin, remained loyal to the memory of King David, the northern tribes, again, called Israel, this is confusing, right? They revolted from following Solomon's son, Rehoboam, had to do with a lot of factors, well, I talked to you about worship already, but also when Solomon built the temple in the southern kingdom, he conscripted essentially slave labor for years at a time, just went to the north and made men come to Jerusalem to work for free building that temple, and they resented it immensely. Uh, so again, and then the way that one worships. So the tension is mounting. Once again, please note, the southern kingdom is called Judah, only two tribes, uh, and it has Jerusalem. The northern kingdom is called several things, Israel, Samaria, and Ephraim. Uh, all of those refer to the same thing. And what's really confusing is many people use the term Israel to refer to the whole shebang. Um, so when you say Israel, you need to ask sometimes, are you just talking about the northern kingdom Israel at this historical time? Or are you talking about all of the descendants uh, of Abraham who received the covenant promise to David, who are now split and are separate nations? This is a picture that shows you, and I know this this seems like a lot of uh, maybe background, but I think this background is critical because you we just can't understand it if we don't look at big picture. Um, the kingdom of Israel, you see, with the capital in a city called Samaria, but no temple there. They worshipped in various shrines on top of mountains, and that was intentional. They had priests. They had the same uh, Moses. They had the same Jewish law just not the temple. And then you see the kingdom of Judah. 
Interestingly, you might note that Israel was really not ever a seafaring people. They never really, even under King David, went all the way to the sea. That They weren't interested in that. And so Phoenicia and Philistines, Philistia, they remained uh, the same. But this gives you a bit of a sense. Now, though Jerusalem is in the southern kingdom, it's about as far north as you can get. So that helps a little bit. And then I want to show you, because, you know, after Saul and David and down the line, uh, this is not the whole list, but with the kingdom of Israel split on your left here and the kingdom of Judah split uh, from each other, uh, this will tell you who the kings were. And there were good kings and bad kings, and there are biblical ways to assess that. Um, and you see the timeline there in the middle uh, Elijah was in the ninth century, and Elisha, and Obadiah, and Joel. Um, and then there for a while, there was a little bit of a lull uh, uh, for the prophets. And then Jonah, which is an interesting prophetic story, not quite like the rest. And then these contemporaries, roughly, Amos, Hosea, Micah, and Isaiah, you also have the side to which they prophesied the most, um, Amos, Hosea, and Micah, mostly to the northern kingdom to begin with, but also a word to the southern kingdom. And Micah does some of both in that last quarter of the 8th century BCE. And remember, in BCE or BC, as uh, the old uh, nomenclature, uh, you go backwards. So you have the 9th century before you have the 8th century. Uh, so that's just how that works. And then you see the fall of the northern kingdom is right in 722. And essentially what Micah is going to be telling people is, hey, see what happened in Samaria? Uh, God did that. God called and empowered the Assyrians. And, and God's going to do that to you, southern kingdom. Um, and then this may be the last map, but this is this is kind of a big picture uh, it even in, uh, in the upper uh, left-hand corner of the screen includes Greece, you know, in the ancient world uh, on the other side of the Mediterranean Sea. Um, but it shows uh, how the Assyrian Empire in the darker green, it shows where they were in 824 BCE, but also how huge they were by the early part of the 7th century BCE, uh, they had included Egypt, all of uh, Palestine, Israel, Judah, uh, all of what we call Babylon, some of what we call Persia, all of what we call Syria. They were huge. Um, they simply were huge. Um, and this is the force that we're talking about during the time of Micah, the Assyrians. Um, and then the various, uh, these arrows are helpful for me to just kind of remember. Again, when we're talking about the nation of Israel, the land of Israel, when, where, for whom? Because it varied greatly. Um, the purple, where the Assyrians uh, beat or take Samaria, and essentially the northern kingdom is no more after 721-ish BCE. Uh, after that come the Babylonians, um, and uh, and then the Assyrians uh, take some Gentiles in 721 to fill uh, to fill the northern kingdom of Israel. That sets the stage for that sort of intermixing of Jewish religion and pagan sort of religious worship, where you get the despised Samaritans in the time of Jesus because they've kind of uh, been not pure in their religion. Uh, Micah, the word Micah in Hebrew means who is like the Lord, but it's not really a question so much as it is a, a proclamation that no one compares to the God of Israel. Um, who is like the Lord? Nobody is the presumed answer. Uh, again, Micah, one of the four eighth century prophets, along with Amos, Hosea, and Isaiah. Micah, was a younger contemporary of the court prophet, um, Isaiah. And let me say a bit of a word about that. That means Isaiah lives in the palace in Jerusalem 
is paid by the king. And I've mentioned this many, many times, and it truly is a dilemma. When one is paid and has one's retirement and health benefits and everything else by the powers that be of empire, it's awfully hard, even subconsciously, for a person of integrity not to say the things that the person who feeds you wants to have said. I do believe that has some carryover into our congregations. If a congregation doesn't like what the preacher is saying, and they're freely of their own will putting money in the offering plate, um, sometimes, believe it or not, uh, that offering plate begins to dry up when the preacher says things they did not want to hear. Uh, so it begs the question, uh, is a faithful preacher the one who tells us what we already know and decided that we believe? And do we call somebody to tell us what we already believe, or do we call someone to challenge us? Uh, which does scripture do? Uh, ponder that. Micah, on the other hand, was a member of the poor rural laboring class. He came from Moresheth Gaf, uh, over toward um, Philistia. Uh, you might have heard of uh, Goliath of Gath um, when uh, that part uh, of what was now the southern kingdom was part of Philistia, uh, the giant who fought King David. Uh, Micah wasn't assuming the same things Isaiah was. Uh, Isaiah proclaimed that Jerusalem could never be defeated. Never, because God promised. Uh, Micah knew the vulnerability of the outlying real, uh, rural areas. Um, very much, uh, very much vulnerable to the Assyrians who had already laid waste to the northern kingdom. So Micah was very worried that that was going to happen to his town and all the little towns around him and probably to Jerusalem. So again, most of Micah's time spanned only the last quarter century uh, of the 8th century BCE. Um, and uh, Ahaz the son of Jotham, the father of Hezekiah, those kings. Ahaz was a very weak, indecisive king. But Hezekiah, his son, was a very strong king. The priests and the prophets supported Hezekiah. Um, he centralized worship in Jerusalem, can't worship anywhere else, suppressed the cult practices, the shrines on top of the mountain in the southern kingdom. Um, and also expanded Jerusalem's borders to help accommodate all of the refugees who fled the northern kingdom after the fall of Samaria in 721 BCE. Hezekiah built the famous 1,750-foot uh, uh, tunnel in Jerusalem that protected the water supply from Assyrian siege. Siege warfare lasted for years, and one of the things they often did was cut the city off from water uh, or poison the water uh, system. But Hezekiah uh, worked around that in a successful way. Uh, I have walked the length of Hezekiah's tunnel in Jerusalem. Very, very narrow. Sometimes you have to turn sideways because your shoulders won't fit. And at places, it was over my belly button. Uh, so, uh, And the water is rushing through there. And it's cold. Um, and it's dark. Uh, so uh, it's it's a really kind of an eerie thing to do, but Hezekiah's tunnel is still there, carved into the ancient stone. Hezekiah also formed a coalition to fight Assyria with Philistia and Phoenicia, uh, the coastal uh, folks. Uh, Sennacherib of Assyria was the uh, the ruler at that time. So again, uh, when you see what was happening. Um, you see up to the, the north, the Phoenician states uh, right on the coast, uh, the Philistine states um, where you have a city called Gaza. Does that uh, ring a bell with anyone? Um, and so they have this coalition and they're fighting and there are all sorts of biblical narratives in the other prophets and in First uh, and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles about those battles and that reality. Let's talk about uh, a little bit the structure 
uh, of the book of Micah. Um, most people very clearly see that Micah is in two sections. Um, the uh, the very beginning, and they don't include verse one because that's called a superscription. It just kind of notates the time based on who the kings were at that time. And we can figure out when that was pretty closely. But one verse two through 515. Um, and then there's another section that almost seems to be written in a different hand, which might in fact have been written in a different hand. Uh, chapter six, uh, verses one through uh, seven, uh, chapter seven, verse 20. And there are oracles throughout the whole thing, and they are a pattern of alternating back and forth. You know, like I prayed, remember the prophets will afflict the comfortable, and the prophets will comfort the afflicted. And so they do both. Sometimes they alternate, and sometimes they're doing both at the same time. Um, the, the back and forth pattern here is doom. Uh, you've been unfaithful. Uh, God's going to get you. Salvation. There's yet hope, at least for a remnant. Doom. No, salvation. Doom. Salvation. Now, this is not a new pattern. If you think about the book of Genesis, um, there's a repeating pattern, really, from the beginning. God creates human beings, puts them in paradise, uh, blessing. There is a breach. Human beings break that. In the garden, you know, they eat the forbidden fruit. They're cast out of the garden, but they don't die right at that point, and God uh, continues to be with them. And then they have children, and that's a blessing. And then Cain kills Abel, and uh, Cain is sent away, but God puts a mark on Cain so that nobody will kill him, which begs the question, interestingly, among uh, biblical literal scholars, um, what far country was Cain going to where somebody might kill him if Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel were the only two people. See, uh, it's not meant to assume that. Um, and then on and on and on. I mean, you get you get the blessing. Uh, you, you get Noah uh, and the flood, but then you get the rainbow uh, and you get just all of these times that, uh, back and forth. Uh, doom, salvation, doom, salvation. So God is a God of deliverance and forgiveness. And yet there are consequences for who we are. So what is Micah's major message? Um, even though Micah is from the southern kingdom, like Isaiah is, uh, and I think Amos is as well, but Amos comes from the southern kingdom as a dresser of sycamore trees and a shepherd to proclaim to the northern kingdom. Even though he's from the southern kingdom, Micah doesn't buy the David Zion inviolability of Jerusalem. That means Jerusalem can never be compromised. Isaiah said it that that was the case. Micah said, uh-uh, Jerusalem's just as vulnerable as everybody else. In uh, chapter 3, Micah delivers this bitter oracle against Jerusalem, which in fact comes true. Micah identifies more with the Moses and Sinai tradition. I mean, where does Moses talk to God? Not in a temple, up on a mountain, um, multiple times. And God appears in the mountain. Uh, and Moses is more central in Micah's thought than for Isaiah. Um, also, I wanted to let you know that Micah seems to be concerned chiefly, like Amos, like Hosea, uh, but with all of the prophets. Remember how profoundly central justice was for those of you who studied Isaiah with us three years ago? Uh, the so what? What what does this mean? Not just for the, the wealthy uh, and the well-fed, uh, and the educated and the powerful for the priests, the judges, the royalty, 
uh, the landowners and all of this. But what does it mean for all of God's people, this whole reality of justice? Micah points to corrupt political and religious officials. He blames the capital cities, especially Samaria in the north and Jerusalem in the south. Uh, and he cites the fall of Samaria as what will happen to uh, Jerusalem eventually. He rails against socioeconomic injustice. And he insists that religious worship without social justice is meaningless, uh, especially an advocate for shepherds and for poor farmers whom the rich were exploiting. How were the rich exploiting them? Uh, they were much like sharecroppers, if you want to sort of make an analogy, uh, in the 20th century South here in the United States. And they were making these farmers become so indebted that the wealthy people could then eventually take over the farmer's land that their families had owned for centuries. Um, and so that the poor got poorer and the rich got richer. Um, and even so, Micah ends with a word of forgiveness and hope with Jerusalem at the center, uh, a center of peace for for all nations. And peace only happens when all nations and all peoples have justice and are treated fairly. Now, this is the ongoing challenge that we seem to have. Uh, I'm going to stop my share right now. I'm also just going to point out, and then I'm going to be done in a minute and Today, if you have questions, you can write them in the chat and we'll get our Synod staff people who are here um, uh, either to address those uh, and or to save those uh, for me well, when I get back. If you want to know what my thought is um, on some of these questions. Uh, but if you haven't read Micah through yet, uh, there are some <clears throat> famous passages. Uh, some of them are coming up soon in the Advent and Christmas seasons. Um, Bethlehem is named as the birthplace of this new messianic figure who will come to establish this reign um, of justice. And you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are little among the tribes of Israel, for you shall come forth a righteous shoot from the stump of Jesse, um, you know, uh, who you know, progenitor of David. Um, so uh, so this new King David, this new king in the Davidic line will come from Bethlehem, uh, this tiny little place. So uh, so that becomes a central reality. Uh, we hear it quoted quite often, of course, uh, the whole thing about uh, beating the swords into plowshares and the spears into pruning hooks, that that is what God will do when uh, this king comes, uh, that it will be no more war, uh, this this reign and vision of peace. But it has to be for all people because you can't have the no more war when some people are oppressed. And then you get that antagonism almost toward worship practices, much like Amos in the prophet Amos. Amos just says, I hate your festivals. I hate your worship. I, I hate the smell of your uh, incense offerings. I don't want any rams. I don't want any goats. Now, Micah says the, essentially the same thing. You know, what, this, what do you think God wants? Come on, let's just think about it. This is not a rhetorical question. Does God want 10,000 rivers of oil? Is, is that what God wants you to present to God? Um, 10,000 rams, you know, uh, you know, as a sacrifice. Is, is that what God wants? no. He has told you, this is chapter six, he's told you, oh, mortal, <laughs> mortal, that means not God, told you what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? Not just wish, but require is the word used. So the so what, but do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with your God. Now, let me just say a word about justice. We talked about it 
uh, ad nauseum in Isaiah, but it is so critical. It's not Greek justice. It's not lady justice with the scales where you get what's coming to you. Don't work, you don't eat. You know, all of these kind of things that we that we talk about or the you know, justice of the court system that you did this and now you will be punished. No, justice for the Hebrew tradition from the beginning is um, you don't get what you earn or you don't get what you deserve, but that God is justice and God brings to you the goodness of God uh, in carrying out the big so what of of peace among the nations, of not oppressing others, in treating others, and eventually what Jesus quotes is the golden rule, as we would like to be treated ourselves. Um, so God's justice uh, is not something that we earn. It is something that is a part of God's deliverance and our very salvation as people of God. It changes our very being so that we may live uh, for others. Uh, not you get what you deserve, but everybody has what they need. Did you hear that? Not you get what you deserve, but that everybody has what they need. And then we spin our wheels all over the place debating what we need versus what we want. Um, do people need shelter? Do people need freedom? Do people need food? Do people need medical care? Uh, what, what is it that people need um, just by virtue of being human beings that we can give to them? That is the work of justice, what it is that all God's people need and not what they deserve. Well, I'm going to stop. Um, uh, and so, as you could see, we didn't get actually into the scripture. Next week, we will look at um, all of chapter one and the first half of chapter two uh, in the actual scripture. And we'll go, you know, word by word through that since it's a shorter book. But uh, I am going to stop this recording and then hand it back over to the other Synod staff who will be working on this today. God bless you. And I look forward to uh, to being with you in person. Bye-bye. That was a lot of maps tonight, y'all. <laughs> um, so thanks for hanging in there um, for this background with Bishop Smith. Um, I was laughing with a colleague that I said, even um, on video, you still get some of Bishop Smith's personality uh, coming through, especially as he was rapping where to find Micah in the Bible um, at the beginning part of that. I want to just say two things as um, we look at questions and um, a couple of things that I want to start with. Um, Bishop Smith mentioned in um, that there'd be a court prophet and that Micah was not a court prophet and a court prophet would be paid for by the king. And somebody asked this question, would prophets paid by the king have known that kings were an authority figure put in place by the Lord? Um that's a really hard question to answer, first of all, because um, I don't think we can answer what God was revealing to these prophets. But I think what we can say really clearly is that God was using these prophets to hold a hold together um hold kings and leaders accountable for the responsibility that they had over God's people in a particular area or territory. So I don't know. Uh, I can't say that the prophets knew kings were put in place or not. And in fact, it's kind of a challenging question too, because some of these kings, um, you know, uh, pillaged villages and then said, okay, now I'm in charge. Is that of God or is it not of God? You know, those, those different kind of components. So that, that's one thing that I want to say. 
Um, Roger had in here the question or this comment. It seems that salvation after doom um, should be for us to evolve, right? For us to get better. Um, or do, but do we, or do we fall back or take revenge? Um, and I think as Lutherans in particular, we are people who understand that we are saint and sinner at the same time. And one of the things that I love about that reality, about being saint and sinner at the same time, is that it acknowledges that we have beautiful capacity to be God's people in this world. And it acknowledges that we have absolutely enormous capacity to be our humanity, right? <laughs> and to not be the best versions of ourselves in this world. And so I think as we think about this, Roger, I think the really um, interesting part of that conversation is that we we are in this this cycle and it it's one of the reasons why Jesus comes to us as messiah is that we have the ability then to be gathered together um but it is certainly in the prophets the doom salvation doom salvation doesn't end um and so that's part of part of the conversation the last thing i want to say is somebody mentioned in here um yeah <laughs> our, our our daily lives yes I've been reading the scriptures with my little kids at night during Lent and my sweet Olive, she has great capacity to love the world. And the other night we were reading about Isaiah or um, Esau and um, Jacob and Esau and that Jacob stole Esau's blessing. And I said, Olive, she's five, by the way. I said, Olive, what would you do if um, your brother tricked you out of something? She's like, I would literally kick him. And I was like, oh, then we need to read the Bible a little bit more because we don't sound like Jesus yet, right? Like that we have this in our daily moments. And again, it's one of the reasons I love being Lutheran. We do not have this sense that we are being perfected, like the sin is going to disappear from us and we'll never have doom again. We know that God is in the rhythm of doom and redemption and doom and redemption. And we have the testimony of that in the cross and resurrection. And so that that's certainly part of it. The current board of Israel, does it include Judah? Um, the answer is yes, but it's not a simple answer because remember that there's Palestinian land in that space as well. Um, and so it does include the Southern and Northern kingdom, but you can't just um, easily layer it on top of each other. One of the things I was thinking about, um, we are gonna send you an e-news. Um, we can include the recording from this session. And I was thinking it might be helpful for me to um, get some of those maps so that you can see the maps and kind of look at them as you read and notice them. Um, and Kathy, I can ask Bishop Smith to pull a map of the current um, which, as you well know, based on our what's going on, um, the landscape is changing as we speak of what's under occupation, what is being those different places. But but the strip of land um, that he was he was talking about today would include the northern and southern the northern and southern kingdom. Next week, we're going to be I talking specifically about. Um, specifically about chapters one and chapters two and pastor cassie who's been doing the tech hosting um will be your uh bishop staff member that will be engaging with you next week so we are grateful for you um blessings upon your evening thank you for hanging in all the history um and as bishop smith prayed right at the end which i loved was open our hearts open our minds change our lives Amen. So may that be the blessing of your night. Thanks so much, y'all.